Now we're going to talk about dementia. So my background, as Cheryl was saying, is um, I'm a nurse practitioner, board certified in psychiatry. I specialize in dementia, and I have a doctoral degree in nursing. And I have the privilege every day of working with people who have dementia and their loved ones. And they are my greatest teachers. So I'm going to share with you what I've learned, OK? But the best care for advanced dementia isn't high tech. The best care for people who have advanced dementia is high touch. And that's what we're going to talk about, OK? The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about what is dementia, because a lot of people have misperceptions about it. And as Oprah says, when we know better, we do better. So I guarantee you, when you leave here today, you're going to know more about dementia than you did coming in. And then I charge you with the responsibility of making sure that the community learns more about it, too. Bring this up in conversations. The more we know, the better we can do. The most frequently asked question is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? The difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease is that there are over 70 types of dementia. Dementias are brain disorders. But the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, OK? But I bet. You know of people who have other forms of dementia, like Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, vascular dementia. There's um, ones that are called frontotemporal degenerations. But Alzheimer's is the most common type. But I'm going to try to use the word dementia because I don't want to exclude anybody. And I'm going to have to talk about generalities. But still, let's review this. And the way that I teach the medical students and the medical residents is um, I, I teach them all about the brain cells and the chemicals. But I think what I do differently is say to them, have them reflect, what would this feel like if it was happening inside of you? Because when we can appreciate what it must feel like on the inside to have dementia, I think it helps us respond better to the person and create a world around them that feels safe and that they feel respected and loved and cherished. So we joke about it all the time. What's the first thing to go in something like Alzheimer's disease? Memory, yeah, we joke about it all the time. OK, now there's different types of memory. There's short-term memory, long-term memory. Which is the one that goes first in, in dementia? Short-term. OK, now, here's the critical difference. If you go up leaving with this piece of knowledge, you're way ahead of the game. Has anybody here ever walked into a room and said, what did I just walk in this room for? Yeah. Have you ever gone? to introduce somebody that you've known forever, and you look at them and go, what's your name again? Have you done that? OK. There are normal age-related changes in our memory. And they start at around age 30. Yeah. The normal change that occurs is that it takes us longer to retrieve the information. But given enough time, We'll retrieve it. Sometimes I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go, that's the name of the song I was trying to tell her. I think it takes us longer to retrieve it, because as we get older, we have so much more in there, don't we, than when we were younger? OK. But now here's where it becomes abnormal. As we age, if the changes in our memory start to interfere with our day-to-day independent, safe functioning, like we've done our whole life, if it starts to interfere, we've got a problem. Does it mean it's dementia? No, it doesn't. And the reason I want to clarify that is it's normal human behavior that if you think you're having Alzheimer's disease, when people say, how are you? You don't go, well, thanks for asking. I think I have Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> right? We, because there's such a stigma associated with it that we really don't want, we, and nobody wants that disease. So as a result, we tend to say it's not a big deal. And then we don't go to a, a health care provider to get it checked out. And that's normal because we're fearful. But I need you to know today and to share it with your friends that just because you have something wrong with your memory does not mean that you have dementia. Do you know that if you have sleep apnea, you can have memory problems? If you have heart disease, you can have memory problems. Some of the medications we take 
can cause memory problems, some of the over-the-counter. If your vitamin B12 level is too low, you can have memory problems. If your thyroid slows down, see where I'm going with this? There's so many reasons. So don't be afraid. Go to a good healthcare provider and tell them what you're experiencing. If the person looks at you and says, you're getting old, what do you expect? Don't worry about it. May I suggest to you that even though that's the answer you want to hear, go to another provider and get it checked out. You're worth it. Make sense? Okay. So, the, so what's not normal is when the memory changes start to interfere with your day-to-day -day functioning. Get it checked out. Now, the short-term memory problems that occur in somebody with Alzheimer's are not like the ones that occur in people who don't have Alzheimer's. So if somebody has Alzheimer's disease and they ask me the same question over and over and over again, I might think, you know what? I'll try to answer the, the, um, them this time louder, thinking that'll go in their brain. Or I might do it slower, thinking that'll get in their brain cells. Or sometimes if they're asking me what time it is, I'll go, it's 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, thinking if I say it three times, it'll go in, right? But with somebody with Alzheimer's, they can't retain the information, okay? And so as you could say it 20 times, and then they'll look at you and go, do you know what time it is? Okay? And so sometimes when that happens, when you're having a hard day, sometimes it doesn't bring out the sainted Mother Teresa in us, right? Sometimes, after somebody's asked us a question many, many times, we might <sighs> sigh, roll our eyes, say something like, I need you to pay attention. Don't you remember? I just told you that. And then they'll go, no, you didn't. Now, you're at a fork in the road here, and let me give you some advice. You can either get into the dance that goes, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, I didn't. But everybody in dementia knows the saying. Nobody has ever won an argument with a person who has dementia. Nobody ever will. So you can spend all your time and energy in the argument, which is the payoff is that everybody's going to feel exhausted and frustrated. Or I can teach you different ways to respond, OK? When you look in the eyes of somebody who has dementia, look in their eyes and you'll see the innocence that accompanies the question, even if they've asked you it 20 times. So the point is, if it's for them the first time every time, no matter how many times you answer, how do we have to answer? Like it's the first time. Because when we love each other, we know how to read every little <sighs> roll of the eyes all of this kind of stuff. And then it would either frighten the person or make them angry, right? Because they're feeling very innocent. All they did was ask you a question. Why are you copying an attitude? Huh? So it's critical for you to know that. Another example would be, what if you said to somebody, don't get up, I just spilled water here. OK, you're not going to get up, are you? No. You're going to stay in your chair? Uh-huh. And then you leave and you hear clunk. Because the person can't retain the information. So help people understand that, because loved ones get so frustrated with the person when they don't follow through. Make sense? Next, thinking and reasoning. Have you tried to think or reason with someone who has moderate to advanced dementia? Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? Not so good. It's great to try. Because people with dementia have good times of day where they can comprehend things better than at other times of day. But if it's not working when you try to think and reason with them, stop. Back off. I'll teach you a new way. OK? Next is language. There's a lot of language changes that occur for somebody who has dementia. There's two types of language. One's called expressive. You have the ability to take your thoughts and feelings put words to them, and express them to others. The other type of language is receptive, that as I'm speaking to you, your brain's taking the information and can process the concept, OK? In dementia, both expressive and receptive languages are impaired. However, they're not necessarily equally impaired. So you may know some people with dementia who don't speak very well. They might go, when they go to talk. 
But meanwhile, you'll notice that when you're talking to them, that they can comprehend it, right? And then vice versa, there are some people with dementia who seem like they can talk pretty well. And many of the time, that's people who have been teachers and preachers, people who have used language very richly in their lives. But just because the words can come out of them does not mean that they can make sense of the words coming in, okay? So you got to, once again, look in their eyes, and you'll get one of three readings. Well, this is how I do it. The first reading I get is, I get you, you get me, we're connected, we understand each other. There's good communication going. The second one is, I'm not quite sure. It's almost like one of those electric bulbs that flickers on and off. They're sort of getting the information, but they're sort of not. The third reading that you might see in the person is, as we'd say in Brooklyn, forget about it, right? I mean, it's just not, nothing's clicking. Nothing's going on there. So language changes over the course of a day in people who have dementia. Have you noticed that? If a person's a morning person and they've slept well the night before and they're not in pain, you can visit with them and you really get a good exchange. You can see the same person at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and notice, I'm not quite sure if we're connecting here. And then you can see that person at 6 o'clock at night and go, nothing's registering. Have you had that experience? So language changes over the course of a day, but the person with dementia doesn't have any control over it. Therefore, when you visit someone with dementia, try to identify when their best time of day is so that you set them up for a more successful experience. If they have to go to the doctor, choose that time. See, and when they're at their worst time of day, keep it, don't place any demands on them. Otherwise, they're going to experience a lot of frustration. And how are we as adults when we have a day that we experience one frustration after another? We're in spite of our best efforts. It's just one of those days when everything goes wrong. How are you at the end of that day? I always say to the nurses, it's like you get out on Scottsdale Road. You finally get to go home. You're so glad that the day is over because it's been so frustrating. And you're driving, and all of a sudden, somebody drives right in your lane and almost crashes into you. So you have to swerve your car. And your heart's pounding because you almost went into a wall. And you look over at the person who just came in your lane, and they don't even know they did it because they're on the phone laughing while they're driving. After a day that you've had when everything has gone wrong, and then when your heart's pounding because you almost got in a serious accident, when you look over at this person who's on the phone driving, is your first response to them, oh, bless you, fellow pilgrim on the road of life? Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, now why would that be? I, I'm looking at a very good-looking, smart crowd, and I'm, I'm sure that your coping resources are quite richly acquired. However, the best of us, on a day when everything goes wrong. Our coping resources over the day become drained, don't they? By the end of a bad day, we are sucked dry. And so, oh, bless you, fellow pilgrim, is not the first thing out of many of our mouths. So, what's it like to have dementia? And from the first thing, when you open your eyes in the morning, you're looking around and you're saying, I want to go home. And people are going, you live here. And you're thinking, yeah, I know, I don't. And then they want to help you do everything, but you don't think you need help. And then they need to help you into the bathroom. And then they stand there while you're trying to go, which I don't even know how people do that, you know? So within an hour of being awake, your brain's probably very fatigued of going, what is going on here, huh? So in the afternoon, let's say I have a brief and it's soiled. If somebody goes to change my brief, I'm thinking, my short-term memory doesn't know who you are, and my lack of insight doesn't know that I soil myself at this point, but my long-term, deeply-rooted Catholic school memory says, nobody touches me down here without my permission. Nobody sees me naked. So when this helper comes in to help me, because I can't understand what they're trying to do, I'm going to give them everything I've got, huh? The way the Creator made human beings, or all animals really, is that when we feel our safety is threatened, we respond using fight or flight, don't we? 
People who are in the advanced stage of dementia don't have a lot of flight left. They can't flee. But can when they fight if they need to? Absolutely. When they fight, if they do this, they get a label put on them. Do you know what the label's called? Combative. But I'm here in this moment. This is the other thing I want you to learn today. If I think somebody's doing something wrong to me down here and they're exposing me and I go to do this, is this combative or is it self-protective? And is this not the way the creator made every one of us? And so certainly if we respond this way, it is not combative, it is not aggressive, it is self-protective. The person with dementia is doing the best he or she can. The only person that's capable of changing is the person without dementia. So therefore, I need to change my approach so that this person does not go into a fear response and think that they're in danger. Huh? Yeah. So language being impaired is really going to complicate our ability to take care of somebody. But still, the good news is we know how to anticipate the needs of people we love. Come on, you've been doing it for decades, right? And so by anticipating people's needs, they won't necessarily have to have as many behaviors to show what they need. Does that make sense to you? OK. Next, function sequencing planning. If, if you were naked and I put your clothes out on the bed, many of you here would put on your underwear first and then your outerwear. Because in our brains, we figure out what we're going to do. Our brains subconsciously go, I'm going to do step one, step two, step three, step four. And then you do it. You don't even have to say it out loud. People with dementia, as they lose their ability to problem solve and sequence, will probably take the piece of clothing that's closest to them or maybe the brightest color that appeals to them because they're not thinking in steps. They can only, all they can think in is step one. And then when step one's completed, you can give them a brand new step one. But it's always step one to them. Does that make sense to you? The reason why I want you to know that is because sometimes unintentionally we say to somebody, May I help you get dressed because then we'll go outside for a drive in the car and we'll go get ice cream. Look at all the things I just said. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know. But instead if I said, may I help you put your jacket on? May I have this arm? Thank you. Good job. May I have this arm? See how I'm breaking it down into bite-sized manageable chunks of information. And I don't go on to the next thing until the first thing is completed because these individuals can't sequence and plan any longer. What we want to do is we want to create what's called no-fail experiences. Because as adults, we're very used to being in control. If we experience one failure after another, it kind of chips away at us. And for people with dementia, I imagine that it's demoralizing to constantly experience a world that goes, no wrong again, you can't do that, let me do it for you. You know what I mean? After the powerful lives that we're all living. So in my world, I want to do things for my patients so that they don't experience failure. If I know that the husband can't help his wife fix the meal by chopping up the, the items because we don't think he's going to do too well with a sharp knife at this point, I can still wheel him up to the sink so that he can rinse the vegetables. Because I'm going to, I'm going to plan everything to make sure that he can still do it. He can still do it in a less way, but he can still do it. So it's normal for people to become very sad about the deficits that Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia cause, that we focus on, you know, he used to be able to do this, but he can't do it any longer. That's normal. But where I invite you to take it, which is different, is once you've experienced what they can no longer do, refocus your attention on what they can still do no matter how little it is, and then celebrate it. Work it, work it, work it, okay? Focus on what the person can still do and what still brings them joy so that we uplift the individual. Personalities can change in somebody with dementia, can't they? Have you seen that? Okay, so it can happen in a number of ways. One, if we have a person who's a very active member of the community, now if they start to get dementia, it's very stressful for them to be around people because they're having difficulty keeping up with the conversation. And they don't want to look stupid because it's embarrassing. So now the person might start to isolate because being around people is too stressful. Some people with dementia have a lifelong history of being very easygoing. 
and suddenly they've got a hair trigger and they're angry at everything. Well, maybe it's because they're recognizing the changes. It's scaring them to death and making them angry and frustrated. We all respond differently to similar situations depending upon how we grew up. An example would be my best friend is a nurse practitioner from a pig farm in Iowa. I am from the absolute inner city of Brooklyn, New York. Being with her is like being with a very delightful Martian, okay? The nicest person in the world. If somebody were to threaten her, she would pull back and go, oh my, you know, she'd be a lady. By the time I was five years old, if somebody threatened me, I would put my hand on my hip, point my finger at them and go, I'll cut you. Now, I had nothing to back it up, okay? But it's just the way we're raised, isn't it? The cultures that we come from. So as the brain starts to deteriorate, people's coping resources with what they've got left might come from who they were. huh? So the New Yorkers could be a problem. The people from Iowa will probably be quite delightful. You know, you see where I'm going with this. So it's kind of interesting, but personalities do change, but it's a result of so many different things going on, huh? But the bottom line, like I always say, though, is the person with dementia is doing the best that he or she can. They are not trying to be a problem. They are not being manipulative, okay? Behaviors. The scientific literature tells us that up to 90% of people who have dementia will at some point along their trajectory of the disease exhibit what's called challenging behaviors, okay? So behaviors are very, very common. But I absolutely believe when we as a society understand these diseases better, we won't see the number of behaviors because we'll be creating a world that feels safer for the person with dementia. So we're gonna talk about behaviors, but let me get to the next slide first. Mood. In dementia, if hundreds of thousands of brain cells are dying, don't we think the chemistry that's in the brain could be a little bit imbalanced? Absolutely. And how does this show up? Sometimes it shows up as anxiety and depression. So I want you to know, even in my advanced dementia patients, I look very hard for anxiety and depression and try to treat that. Because I can't reverse the dementia, but I can help the patient be the best that they can be. I'm going for quality of life you know, versus quantity of days. Insight and judgment, to know that you have something wrong with your brain. Many people initially do know that they have something wrong with their brain, and they'll do things to compensate for it. Maybe they'll have post-it notes on everything, and they'll put their keys. Okay, that sounds like a lot of our lives, right? Don't, don't be scared. But I'm saying at some point for somebody with dementia, these coping mechanisms, these compensatory mechanisms will no longer work, okay, because their brain's starting to have more and more disease in it. Unfortunately, at that time, the person is not safe to live alone, okay? Because the stove could stay on, the bills might not get paid. There are a lot of predators out there in the world who are looking for people who aren't thinking straight to take advantage of them. And so we as the family members need to step in and create a, a safer way for the person to live. Unfortunately, at exactly that, that moment, is when the person with dementia is losing their ability to know that they even have dementia. The classic example of this is, has anybody here tried to take the car keys away from somebody with dementia who should no longer be driving? That, my friends, is a difficult thing to do because the person says, I'm a perfect driver, and you can bring them out to the car and show them the dent and show them the scratches, and they go, I didn't do that, somebody else did it. And they're not lying, okay? They're not lying to you. Their lack of insight truly believes that somebody else did it. So it's very problematic, isn't it? You know, how that times out. Insight and judgment get poorer and poorer as the disease progresses. But I want to I wanna illuminate one thing. If any of you are retired healthcare folks, you'll know that way back in like the 70s or something, we thought that people who had dementia, we called them senile back then, right? We thought at the end stage, when they were kind of in a fetal position with their eyes closed and not talking, we thought that they were kind of like empty shells, that their body was still here, but the rest of them was gone. That's kind of at least how I was sort of taught. We don't believe that anymore. Now we believe and practice under the assumption that the person's in there, even if they can't manifest themselves outward to us using words, et cetera. 
We will never speak in front of them as if, you know, we were to say something that we didn't want them to hear. Got it? We will always speak to them even if they can't speak back to us. Touch them. Say something gentle and loving to them. Always treat them as if they're there. Don't expect them to have a response, but just do that. At Hospice of the Valley, many a time we'll see what's called windows of lucidity. We're out of nowhere somebody who hasn't spoken in months will open their eyes, look in our eyes, and say something quite profound. And then they close their eyes and they go back in. I think that stands as a witness that they are in there. And although I don't have control as to when I can pull that out, we so delight when that occurs. So we will always treat the person as if they're in there hearing us. Make sense? OK. Lastly, visual recognition and spatial orientation. What does that mean? The brain. So the eyes see, but the eyes have to tell the back of the brain the information. What is it you're seeing? How far away is it? Etc. In dementia, although the eyes continue to see, the brain confuses the message. So let me give you a couple of examples. Have you ever seen a, um, an accident where somebody goes to park in front of the store, but instead they drive into the store? OK, one of the things that's happening is the eyes didn't tell them how far away like the store window was. Um, OK, what about this? Uh, on the evening news, how many times have you seen that somebody with Alzheimer's is driving, and this is the license plate of their car, and if you see the car, would you please notify the police because they're missing? Now, sometimes this occurs because people go, look, if you've been going to Safeway for 40 years and it's three blocks away, and it represents your independence, your kids are going to go, what could possibly go wrong? It's three blocks away. She's been doing this for 40 years. But when she gets to the corner, she, the brain isn't saying, make a right here, make a left here. And so most of us say, I've got a full tank of gas. I'll keep driving, because when I see it, I'll recognize it. But the person doesn't recognize it. And many a time can drive out in this area into the desert, and the cars run out of gas. And I have a patient who has advanced dementia who has lived in her one-story, small Scottsdale home for at least 40 years, and she can't find the bathroom in her home because she can't circumnavigate anymore. So see, what I'm trying to say is, even though the eyes see, the brain's just not given, it's not interpreting it correctly. Isn't that interesting? Why all this talk about dementia? What is going on? All of the leading causes of death for Americans are now on the decline because of our incredible medical breakthroughs. All of the leading causes of death except dementia. To date, we do not have any way to prevent it. We don't have any way to cure it. We don't have any way to halt the progression of the damage that's being done. We don't have any way to reverse the damage that's already been done. So the critical question becomes, how do we provide excellent, excellent care for these individuals and their loved ones? Huh. OK. As Dr. Hamilton told you, the most common cause of death that occurs now, Alzheimer's disease is a progressive illness. It's a terminal illness. But usually what people die from is what? She told you before. Aspiration pneumonia. Yeah. Uh-huh. And actually, when it's treated by palliative hospice professionals, scientists have even done a study of what are the most comfortable ways to die. And this is one of the most comfortable ways to die. If you have a fever, we'll take it away. If you have discomfort, we'll take it away. And eventually, you just go to sleep and you pass on. OK? Let's me give you the current statistics just for Alzheimer's disease alone. One out of eight people age 65 and older have Alzheimer's. You do know that every single day, up to 10,000 Americans turn 65, don't you? Every single day for the next 19 years. And one out of eight has Alzheimer's. When we get to 85 and older, and you know people are living to 85 easily these days, one out of two. Is that staggering? So you see that this is, we're talking about epidemic proportions here. That's why this is a very, very serious subject that we've got to learn about so that we can help one another as a society. OK. Very quickly, this is the progression of dementia. You know, we go from the mild stage, then it gets into the moderate and the advanced stage. In that mild stage, we've got some impaired memory. Um, we've got some personality changes. Maybe people are starting to isolate. And we've got the spatial disorientation. Now, some of us were born directionally challenged. huh? 
For those of you who were not born directionally challenged, if suddenly you're having difficulty with direction, does it mean you have dementia? No, but get it checked out, okay? Because it's different from your baseline. When we get to the moderate stage, the disease is moving through more of the brain. If more of the brain is diseased, it's not going to interpret and decipher information as accurately as it once did. Therefore, we'll have increased confusion. And as adults, because we're so used to being in control, when we feel out of control and more confused, we become anxious and we can become more agitated. The brain determines when we wake and when we sleep. And since this is a disease of the brain, we start to see alterations in sleep-wake cycles. Sometimes people's days and nights flip, but more commonly what happens is people sleep in fragments. Like instead of sleeping necessarily eight hours a day, they might sleep four hours a night. Then they're up an hour or two hours. Then they go to sleep for two hours. Does this sound familiar? Some people do that. And then at, towards the end of life, so, <laughs> towards the end of life, sometimes people sleep very, very long segments. That's when they're starting to have more language problems, so expressing themselves using words and understanding words that are being said to them. And now the day-to-day -day tasks that people did so effortlessly are becoming really, really challenging, and the individual with dementia is not able to do them without assistance. Make sense? When we get to the advanced stage, typically that lasts one to three years. And during that stage, we start to see more resistive behaviors. But that, in my opinion, simply means that the person is resisting because they're having more difficulty understanding who you are and what you're trying to do. And you're doing it more quickly than their brain can make sense of. For instance, you all think at lightning speed. Boom, 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 boom. People with advanced dementia don't think that quickly anymore. They think more slowly, like this maybe. So if you're still going through your world like this, trying to get stuff done, to a person with dementia that is whizzing by so quickly they can't possibly connect with it. So they might be resistive. So resistiveness to me means slow down, explain yourself more clearly, and pace at the pace that's comfortable for the person with dementia. Why? Because the only person capable of changing is me. We also start to see that people are incontinent of bowel and bladder and they have eating difficulties. There is a motor strip in our brain. It's about right around here. And it talks to our body in a way that we don't even put any effort into it. If I say raise your hand, you just do this. You don't have to sort of go, you know, to try to make your brain do that. In dementia, there seems to be this disconnect between the motor strip and the body actually doing it. An example might be, have you ever said to somebody with dementia, may I have your hands? And they go, okay. And you're waiting for their hands. And then you go, may I have your hands? And they go, okay. And meanwhile, they're not giving you the hands. They're trying. It's just that the motor strip isn't doing this, doing it. Now, sometimes I'll see people who are hungry sitting in front of food, but they can't, they're not eating. And sometimes it's because their motor strip isn't talking to their hand to get the food to them. So sometimes you can take your hand and put it on theirs and help them get the food to their mouth. And if you do it a couple times slowly, you'll notice that sometimes you can release your hand and they'll continue doing this. There's a phrase for that called priming the pump. It kind of gets the brain muscles all kind of working together. So it might be something you want to try. Okay, at end of life, this is hospice time now. The person's usually in a bed or a chair. They're not, they're not up walking around on their own anymore. Essentially, they need assistance you know, from one place to the other. Their language abilities are very short, very small. They're not really saying sentences anymore as much as maybe stereotypical phrases. Yes, okay, thanks, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, we're starting to see that they are getting more and more infections. And as we all know, when you have repeated infections, it's telling something, a bigger message about your body, your immune response, etc. And so when we see these infections, if it fills their healthcare decisions, we might give them antibiotics. But even when we do, their infections start to come back, you know? And that really tells us that we're getting near the end. When we see swallowing difficulties, remember the brain's job, it coordinates swallowing. Swallowing is a complex coordination of movements to occur. When that swallowing starts to have problems, we know that probably they're gonna get an aspiration pneumonia. Does that make sense? 
We believe now that behaviors are the only effective form of communication a person with dementia has in order to let us know something's wrong. Comfortable people with dementia do not scream, do not fight, do not try to escape. Okay, make sense? If they're comfortable, they're making the hang. If they're experiencing discomfort, their brain isn't necessarily saying, oh, you know what's bothering you? It's that darn hip of yours. And it's pain, and if you tell the nurse she'll give you medicine, she'll take it away. Instead, the person with advanced dementia will probably interpret it as, something's going on down here and I don't like it, okay? It leads to irritability. As you know, when you're in pain, it kind of sucks energy out of your brain to pay attention to things, right? So we know that many of these behaviors we see are actually just the person's ability to communicate on feeling discomfort in body, mind, or spirit. Does that make sense to you? So many a time it's physical pain. How many times? <laughs> I'm going out. I just got a call for a lady. <laughs> Every time they go to dress her and everything, she fights. They said she called, they called her a wildcat. That's what her family calls her. Okay, she's 100 years old, has a history of fractures in her hips and her shoulders, and is not on one aspirin or Tylenol. Now, when I dress you, it means I'm going to increase your range of motion, right? Quite a bit. Why do you think she's a wildcat? Because it hurts, but her brain isn't necessarily telling her it's pain. So people may be saying, Mom, are you having pain? And she goes, nope. But just think about it. Use your sense. Of course she might. And so, of course, we're going to try treating her for pain and seeing if she's more comfortable. Because comfortable people with dementia do not kick, scream, bite, yell, try to escape. Okay. One of the most important things I want to tell you is about caregiver approach. When you have dementia and you're not quite sure of what's going on, you feel vulnerable, okay? When you have dementia and you're in the moderate or advanced stage, you're such a high fall risk that people who love you want to keep you in a chair or a bed so that you don't fall down. Therefore, what happens, consequently, is that when you interact with other human beings, your eyeballs have to look up. When our eyeballs have to look up, it makes our brain feel more vulnerable. So you have a vulnerable person, and now you're trying to interact with them, but you're making them feel more vulnerable. So I am always down here. The picture with Stella, the first slide, you saw me down here, and that was a reason for that. I always try to get below somebody's eyes because that makes their brain feel more comfortable. Now, you might say, I can get down there, but I can't get back up. So pull up a chair. Just pull up a chair, but that's the most compassionate thing you can do. Next, even if they can't understand language, right, even if they can't understand what's being said to them, they'll always be able to read your tone of voice and your body language. So if you're frustrated and go, I'm sorry which many of us married people have tried to pull off. I'm sorry. Do we look or sound sorry? No. The person with dementia can read our tone of voice and our body language. So we need to be mindful of what does my presence feel like? What is it saying? Next, thank goodness a smile is a smile is a smile, isn't it? People with dementia, they say they feel like strangers in a strange land. And even when you walk in, if you're smiling, if they don't know that you're their loved one, They'll go, that looks like a very nice person. And it brings comfort to the person with dementia. And that's our highest goal, isn't it? Comfort. So caregiver approach is very, very important. Now, I'm from Brooklyn. I move really fast, but not around my folks with dementia. I slow way down. And the tone of my voice is with great respect and compassion, tenderness. I really believe that even though our thinker's broken in dementia, okay, the higher parts of the brain, the thinking, the reasoning is broken, the great news is our feeler is still very much intact. For instance, um, I just drove by a golf course on the way here, and the smell of the freshly mowed lawn it just lifted me. You know what I mean? Um, who here has ever put a piece of food in their mouth to make themselves feel better? Yeah, it works, doesn't it? So at Hospice of the Valley, what we do is we have this form called the About Me, and it lets me know if, if you can't tell me who you are because of your dementia, but if you have great pride in the fact that you were a police officer or a teacher, I want to know so that when I go in, I go, it's so nice to meet you. I hear that you're a retired school teacher. What a noble profession. Think of all of the people in your life that you have helped. 
I swear to you, people who don't use language will lock eyes with me and they get me. So we find out what brings pride, meaning, love to this person. And then all of these other sentences, my favorite sentence is, things that bring me peace or solace. Okay, for a farmer who's in a nursing home, let's say, getting him out to hear the birds sing, to feel the sun on his face, putting his tootsies in the grass, that fills his cup. You know what I mean? Better than any pill. We've got to remember this stuff. When your thinker's broken, your feeler still works. And what talks to your feeler, your emotions? The five senses do. Have you ever heard a song where suddenly you're back to when you first heard that song with the people that you're with and you get goosebumps and maybe your eyes well up with tears? That is a profound neurochemical cascade that occurs in your body simply because you heard a couple of notes. If that was a pill, it would cost a fortune. It's for free. But one person's musical heaven is another person's musical hell, huh? Yeah. So we've got to know for the person, what is their favorite smell? What's their favorite form of touch? What are their favorite treat foods? Is it chocolate? Is it ice cream? What are the things that bring them solace? What is the song that's going to make the difference in them? And then we use this to customize the approach so that every morning, noon, and night with Stella, if I know that she loves a Frank Sinatra song, I'm going to sing it to her. My favorite saying is this. To love someone is to learn the unique song that's in their heart and to sing it back to them when they have forgotten. And that encapsulates Hospice of the Valley's dementia program, that if you forget who you are, I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to sing your song back to you every morning, noon, and night, so that although I can't reverse the damages that occur in dementia, I will try to uplift you and to maximize your comfort in body, mind, and spirit until you draw your very last breath.